Welcome to lecture 14 of EfficientML.ai. So today we are going to learn something new, which is efficient region transformers. In the last lecture and the lecture before that, we talked about large language models. Basically, how do we apply transformers to solve natural language processing tasks? But transformers is so powerful, uh, the model capacity is so large, it is even helpful for those region tasks. So in this year's EfficientML.ai, we thought it might be uh, crucial to add a new chapter, which is about region transformers. But region transformers are pretty big. They have to, big, to be big in order to have good performance. Then immediately, we want to solve the problem of efficiency. How do we design those efficient region transformers that run fast on the hardware? So this is the agenda for today's lecture. We are going to first introduce the basics of region transformers. How do we use transformers to solve region tasks compared with language tasks? Um, and also, how do we accelerate it? What are the efficient, uh, efficient designs of region transformers, such as using the windowed attention, uh, using the linear attention, uh, using sparse attention? And you can see the sparsity here is actually quite different from the sparsity uh, we have visited before in the weight sparsity. And then, since VIT requires a large data set uh, to, be power, uh, to be, uh, make it effective, and we not always have uh, those large-scale data sets, uh, which is labeled. So how do we utilize this supervised learning to uh, exploit unlabeled data by contrastive learning and also mask image, uh, mask image modeling? Uh, finally, let's combine what we learn about language and also uh, vision uh, to talk about multi-model large language model that can handle both vision and also language inputs. Now, two representative uh, modalities. One is using the cross attention, like in Flamingo, we're going to introduce perceiver, and also using uh, visual tokens, treating image as tokens in the Palmi style. So it'll be a pretty exciting journey. And let's start with the basics of vision transformers. So uh, naively, uh, let's think about what is, uh, how do we apply transformer to images? So previously we mentioned uh, we can tokenize the word in language um, to use a 1D representation for each token. What about the image? Can we tokenize images? A natural way would be like to chop image into several patches, and each patch we treat it as a token. In this example, we have um, nine patches, uh, and then we can put them in the 1D array to convert this 2D image into a sequence of patches, and each patch is a token, so that we can feed the token in transformers. And how exactly do we implement that? Uh, so this is a, uh, we can put it in detailed context, like the image size is 96 by 96. We have three patches, so each patch, what is the size? 32 by 32. Okay, so now the number of token is nine, and what is the dimension for each token? Three channels, 32 by 32, so 3,000 um, dimension for each token. And then um, we have a hidden size of the transformer, right? So we pass it through a linear transformation to convert from the image domain into um, the hidden, uh, hidden dimension, which is uh, 768 in this case. So in this way, we do a linear projection of those flattened patches. So what is missing here? Everything is flattened. There is no relationship knowing that. So this patch and this patch, they're actually not contiguous, but they became, it becomes contiguous in the patch. So how do we solve that problem? Actually, we can use apply positional encoding so that you have the position information. A practical implementation um, for this kind of projection is by using convolution because we are applying uh, the same 32 by 32 uh, conv weights across different patches. So we can naturally implement that 
by using convolution kernels, right? So the key difference here is that we have to use stride of 32. So there's no overlap. Kernel size is 32, stride is also 32. So window one, window two, window three. So that's how we use convolution to actually implement this linear projection. Since convolution kernels are very well implemented, very efficient um, on the GPU. And after that, we can treat it exactly the same as treating languages. We have the positional encoding, we have the hidden, uh, we have the embedding, we add it with the positional um, encoding, pass it through the multi-head attention, um, the layer norm, uh, and also the FFN layers. So which is the same, exactly the same way as when we are treating languages. Just one token, another token, another token. So there are different variants in, in the VIT. So we can, this is the typical dimension of the VIT base, VIT large, and also the VIT huge. From 12 to 32 layers, hidden dimension from 700 to uh, 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 1,280. The size of the MLP from 3,000 to 5,000, uh, this number of has, uh, hundreds of millions of parameters. In contrast, what is the size of Res 50? 25 million. So this is about 10 times larger number of parameters. So each um, vision transformer, you can apply different patch sizes. Okay? Um, so here we, are, we can apply two all the way to 32 patch sizes. So the computation, which one its computation will be larger, smaller batch size or a larger batch size. Which one? Yes, because higher, longer in them. Right, it will be a lot more number of tokens in that case. So when we are saying like VIT-L16, it means it's the large version, L for large. Dash 16 means uh, the patch size is 16 by 16. Like every 16 by 16 pixels is treated as a single token. So that's the notation for uh, vision transformers. How does vision transformer VIT compare with CNNs? Actually, this is when we are Clicking the number of pre-training images. When the images number amount of images is small, actually VIT is inferior to CNN. But once there is a huge, larger, much larger amount of training images, the VIT begins uh, begins to outperform CNNs. So VIT require large amount of data, labeled data. So that motivated us for unsupervised, self-supervised training in in a moment later. Okay, so far we introduced the mechanism of VIT and how to make it faster. What is the limitation of VIT? What is the computation constraints characteristics of vision transformers? So we are going to use introduce efficient VIT, the multi-scale linear attention for high resolution dense prediction. So first of all, High resolution, dense prediction vision tasks are very crucial, such as medical image segmentation. We have to be, uh, we have to run at a high resolution to distinguish uh, different diseases, and also super resolution. Um, it's a um, high resolution, dense prediction task. We have to predict from this input to, to the to the output for each pixel. We have to make a prediction. So it's dense prediction. The compute is pretty heavy. And also in autonomous driving, uh, high resolution is crucial. You want to distinguish um, the, the cyclist versus if you use a very low resolution, the cyclist will just disappear. So this one, uh, this figure is showing the accuracy gap using a high resolution versus using a low resolution input. The benefit of the MLU, the segmentation accuracy, is pretty significant using a larger resolution. 
However, the compute, right, the Gmax, still remember Gmax, the number of multiplication and add, the compute also grows quadratically with the input resolution compared with uh, the CN architecture where the compute doesn't grow as fast as this uh, VIT architecture. Due to the attention map is n square, right? O n square. And so if you have the um, number of pixels increasing, the number of the, the size of the attention map, the compute of the attention map will grow quadratically with the resolution, which is pretty bad. As a result, um, some uh, this is some pioneering work about uh, using apl applying region transformers to segmentation task called Segformer on this uh, CD escapes data set, which is for autonomous driving. Actually, uh, it runs very slowly. Only about 1.6 frames per second. But applying uh, efficient VIT, we can make it much faster. 21 frames per second. And this is measured on NVIDIA uh, JSON AGX Orin, a autonomous driving mobile GPU platform. And the MOU is actually even better um, compared with the baseline. So let's see how it works in a moment. Another application is AR and VR applications. For example, this segment anything from Meta. Uh, we've seen this. You can have a prompt, which is the red, red dot, uh, indicating where you are looking at. And it's going to segment the point where you, that you're looking at. For example, here is segment from the person, the cook, countertop, living room, etc. Again, this requires very high resolution fence prediction for the segmentation map. So here, let's diverge a little bit to talk about how segmentation anything works. It has an image encoder, takes an input, and then uh, encoded into image features. Uh, it's a promptable image segmentation. What does it mean promptable? It can take several prompts, just like in um, NLP task. The prompt could be the mask. It could be the point. And then tell me what is the, uh, the whole object, the, the mask, of this certain certain point, or it can be a box, like you have a rectangle and can tell you uh, the exact mask, segmentation mask, or even using text. This one is not released yet. It, can also, it is also amb amb ambiguity aware, because um, for the same point, you want to have the segmentation mask. It can mean either uh, the whole scissors, or only the handle, or half of the handle. And finally, propose the automatic data engine to use the model to annotate the image, get the mask, get the data, and use the data to train the model and form a virtual cycle to continuously improving uh, the quality of the model. There's more than 1 billion plus uh, mask and 11 million images. In contrast, ImageNet is about 1.2 million, so this is 10 times larger amount of images. Okay, so let's go back to talk about the efficient techniques for a vision transformer. A natural way uh, to overcome this issue where the compute grows quadratically with the resolution is that we can use this windowed attention. Okay, so previously, um, here we have 16 tokens. If the resolution gets larger, the number of tokens will get larger, assuming the patch size stays the same. But here we can do attention only within a lab, within a window, okay, within the patch. So this is doing attention among the patches. This is doing attention within the patch. So each window, the attention can be done in parallel. This is the batch dimension, the number of windows. Okay, and the window size is fixed. So n squared, the attention map size is fixed, and another. The amount of computing just grows linearly with the resolution. So that's the benefit of using such windowed attention. And also, we can gradually downsample, downsample the image. So in the previous original VIT, there is no downsample. 
uh, the number of tokens keeps the same. But here we can apply down sample um, so that the number of patches can keep decreasing. But what is the problem here? If we constrain the attention to be within the window, there is no information exchange. So the information only flows within this patch. You have the n by n attention map. Only several pixels within this window attend to each other, but there is no attention between the windows. Only when you are doing a dunk sample, you have a larger reception field. But within this, um, uh, this stage, there is no information flow. But how do we solve that problem? So this swing transformer paper, uh, very popular, introduced a very smart idea. So for layer i and layer i plus one, they introduced this shift operation. So shift the pixels by two in this case, so that the adjacent adjacent windows they can exchange the information, allow the information to flow, because in the next uh, i plus two layer, it's going to shift it back. So the window will see see this part. So in that way, the information begins propagate among adjacent windows. So this is the figure for two adjacent blocks. You have a um, this is one block. This is another block. Um, this is multi-head self-attention. And here, there's a W stand for windowed uh, multi-head self-attention. And this is SW stand for shifted window, like windowed shifted window. Okay, so we have uh, this con two consecutive consecutive layer window versus shifted window attention to allow the information to shift to flow among different windows. So in this way, uh, the swing transformer actually outperformed the original VIT with respect to um, its accuracy. Okay, so it's a, over 80% versus below 80%. And here, the uh, throughput is uh, better or comparable with the VIT. On diverse tasks, so this is um, ImageNet, ImageNet 1K, object detection, and, and also segmentation task. So the it's very applicable to different downstream tasks, not only on ImageNet classification, but also on detection and segmentation. So those are for dense 2D images. So in self-driving, um, another key uh, key part is by uh, is working on the sparse point cloud. So this is 2D image, this is dense, you want to do 3D object detection. And also this is 3D point cloud that is sparse. Actually it can be 99.9% .9 sparse. So only 0.1% of the, of the activation is non-zero. GE is going to introduce point cloud processing in the next lecture. But here put in the context of um, Vision Transformer, let's talk about how do we apply Transformer to solve not only 2D image problem, but also 3D point cloud problem. So naturally, we can follow the swing transformers idea. So this is activation the feature map for the uh, point cloud. The point cloud is 3D, but this is just illustration. We show it on 2D. The difference with image is that it is sparse. Some of the points is zero. There's no object in that area. So lots of the points could be zero. The naive way to apply the swing uh, transformer is just using this kind of eco window grouping. Okay, the window size of two by two use the same uh, grouping um, in this case. It has perfect spatial proximity. Everything, uh, each point within this window, they have perfect perfect proximity. They're adjacent to each other, but computationally, such sparsity add irregularity okay sparse as irregularity so like the first group has only one and zero second group has two this group has two this group has only one this group has three it's highly imbalanced therefore it's hard to paralyze 
if you want to do batching to improve the, uh, the utilization of the GPU, uh, sometimes you have to do padding to introduce those extra zeros. And in reality, the distribution of the number of points within the window, okay, number of points, three over four, this distribution varies a lot across the windows. Um, actually, a few of them could be pretty dense, but many of them actually are very sparse. And they differ by two orders of magnitude, making it a lot of waste. So we designed a hardware-friendly way to partition the window, not by fixed window grouping, eco window grouping, but by, by such eco size grouping, so that for each group, they have exactly the same number of uh, the voxels, okay? same number of points, same number of points. But here, the proximity, proximity may not be guaranteed since it's I and D, those two points can be pretty far and farther in this group than any points in this group. But in reality, we find the accuracy is not degraded at all, but even better, even match the performance of using CNNs. So in this way, um, we can be even faster than this CNN-based method and a lot faster than the conventional transformer-based approaches using uh, the eco window grouping approach, which is slow versus it can be much faster measured on the NVIDIA JSON Orient platform. So this is sparse window attention. How do we apply window attention not only to 2D images, but also to 3D point cloud? So the next technique is about linear attention. So window attention is one approach to turn those uh, ON square complexity of the attention map into ON complexity attention map. Another way is by directly using linear attention. And let's see how that works. So this is the conventional softmax attention we have introduced in the large language model lecture where um, you have QK transpose times uh, QK transpose and scale it by a square root of D uh, pass through a softmax and then you get an N by N attention map. This is where the memory and compute get heavy, gets heavy, O N square. And then finally, you uh, weighted average the attention map with the V to get the final result. We want to do something different. So previously, we are using the um, exponential expo AXP function uh, to do the nonlinearity. But we want to replace this nonlinearity function with linear function. Exponentially of Q and K becomes radical Q and radical KT rather than KT transpose EXP. So using that with radical P, K, Q and radical K to the mat mall and then scale it by, by D and we use that as the attention map to uh, weight, find the weight average of the V. What is a good thing about this is that we can Exploit since everything is linear in this case, ReLU is linear rather than the softmax is not linear. ReLU is linear, so ABC equal to A times BC using this associative property of matrix multiplication. We can change the order of QK transpose times V. We want to um, calculate uh, this KV first and then times Q. Okay, so KV uh, pass it through ReLU. And then D by N, N by D, the resulting um, matrix attention map is actually D by D. Since D could be smaller than N, um, the D by D is no longer O N square. Um, so compared with N by N, this D by D attention map will be smaller. And finally, we uh, multiply it with uh, the Q final dimension is still N by D, the same as previous solutions. So the interface, the input and output is exactly the same, but the amount of computing is OD square, is no longer ON square. So that's the trick about linear attention, turning this quadratic uh, compute into linear compute with respect to the number of tokens. C 
seems like a good idea, but there's no free lunch. So this is comparing the attention map of a soft max attention versus the linear attention. Do you see some difference? The attention map for the soft max attention is very sharp at these key points, like the eyes of the dog, the nose of the cat, etc. Well, for this linear attention is much softer. It's much softer. As we can see from uh, this attention attention score okay, for these five values, with softmax, it is a very sharp distribution. And without softmax, the distribution is relatively flat. So this is one limitation about using uh, this linear attention. It also lacks this multi-scale learning ability. Rather than own tokens, everything can attend to each other. So it's probably OK to capture this global information, but this local information capturing, like local, local information capturing is worse compared with the softmax attention. And as a result, the accuracy by directly changing from softmax attention to random attention, you can imagine the accuracy gap is pretty significant. So we need to do something to, to change it. And since the local information, what is a good primitive to model those local features? It's convolution, right? Convolution handles those local feature extraction. So can we partner this linear attention with convolution to solve this problem? And the solution is actually quite straightforward and very simple. Just to insert a convolution branch um, together with the radial linear attention branch. So now we not only have this radial linear uh, linear attention branch, but also the convolution branch in together with the linear uh, linear attention branch. So here we are using a uh, depth-wise convolution, which is light weighted, followed by a group-wise convolution to reduce compute cost and also aggregate nearby tokens to do those local feature modeling to get multi-scale. Uh, QKV tokens, not in scale, one scale, another scale. In this scale, each token has aggregated the three by three in that region, aggregated its neighbor's information so that you can have uh, such multi scale QKV tokens in one branch, another branch, and then you feed it with FFM and depth with calm. Local information. Right, exactly. Global information, local plus global, put them together. What if you only use this bottom branch? Uh, we haven't quite tried that, um, but I think this might be helpful to do some ablation study to try only, only this branch. So as we can see on the right, the, uh, the accuracy gap is not only filled, but actually it's getting better, even, even better accuracy compared with just using the soft max attention. The key idea is by specialization, okay? specializing this global feature extraction, and this branch specializes in the local feature extraction. And the computation overhead here is very light because we are using depth-wise comp and one-by-one -one group comp. I mean, as you can imagine, this is pretty significant speed up on the mobile device, um, a self-driving device, and also cloud data center GPU from eight to two to five x speed up, uh, and, and even uh, maintaining the MIOU on the segmentation task. This is for super res super resolution task. Uh, this is the just by by cubic up sample, uh, resolver, uh, swing IR. A very popular technique for image res super resolution. They run three image per second, four image per second, but we can run like 17 images per second, um, which is about five to six times faster and with even superior PSNR with better quality. And this is the result on segment anything using the um, bounding box as the prompt. Bounding box as the prompt, bounding box as the prompt. 
from 12 images per second to 1009 images per second. This baseline is the VIT huge. This is using the point, a single point, as the prompt for the giraffe. Uh, again, pretty uh, much faster speed. And this is segment everything using many points, segment um, the entire image. Quality is very well maintained. You can tell some of the details. And compared with a few uh, mobile SAM or nano SAM, the efficient VIT is much more accurate and much faster from 300 to 1000, from 700 to 1000 images per second with better um, MLU. Uh, so the last slide is showing the performance on the image net. So here we want to uh, profile both the latency for real-time applications like autonomous driving. So we use the JSON Orin for real-time autonomous driving platform and targeting throughput on the GPU, cloud GPU to show um, the efficient VIT is good at both edge and also cloud devices. Uh, so this is the uh, latency and accuracy trade-off. This is the throughput versus top point accuracy trade-off. So by using an efficient VIT, we demonstrate that it is possible to use linear, com uh, linear attention to replace the softmax attention to achieve, achieve linear complexity with respect to the high resolution. And also combined with a specialization idea for uh, local feature extraction using COV versus global feature extraction using attention, uh, we can have this better trade-off between the accuracy and the speed. Okay, so um, lastly, let's talk about applying sparse attention to make VIT more efficient. Since the vision transformer um, divide image into patches, we can actually think about, should we use sparse and high resolution patches or using dense but low resolution patches? So this is um, resizing the image by half half the resolution, but it's dense, versus um, sparse pixels, high resolution, they have exactly the same amount of compute, since um, the resolution is half, but here the number of pixels, number of patches is re reduced by four times, so the overall they are equal. So let's see uh, which is better. So we can try applying this activation pruning uh, to introduce this, this sparsity into the window of attention. Okay, so previously we have this amount, this times this amount of windows. And we can sort the windows importance by looking at the L2 activation magnitude for each patch. And this one is probably larger, and then we are going to sort, sort them, and we uh, keep the top K important uh, windows and throw away those unimportant smaller windows. And as we go deeper, we can gradually get more and more sparse in this direction. This is hard, very hardware friendly. Why is that the case? It doesn't require a specialized sparse kernel. Because within each patch, the attention is too dense. We are pruning the number of tokens, oh, sorry, the number of patches. So the patch is in the batch dimension in the swing transformer, right? We are doing attention within, uh, within each window, and this is the batch dimension. So we are reducing the batch dimension. So this kind of sparsity is very hardware friendly. We are just using, reducing the batch dimension. So in that case, we can make it easy to run inference efficiently on any hardware. So what about the training part, training time? We need to give the model an idea. We have to make it adapt to such pruning process during training. So here we are doing similar stuff like the once for all network. So during each training iteration, we are sampling different, uh, different patches. Okay, so here we are sample three, two, one, three, two, two, three, three, one. 
it's getting more and more sparse, but the sample sampled patch is different in each case. For the original model, we are trying to adapt the original model okay, without training from scratch. Original model only see dense activations, okay? but we want to improve the sparsity awareness by fine-tuning the pre-trained model with random sampled layer-wise activation sparsity at each training iteration. It's similar to the ones for whole network. Different iteration, we are sampling different part, different sub uh, activations. And here we can do um, evolutionary search similar to our lab three, homework three. So at the first time we sample a certain sparsity, uh, for example, three, two, two, and see if we can satisfy the compute budget and also the accuracy budget. So we keep it, otherwise we sample again until um, satisfaction. And this way we can outperform the random search using evolutionary search in red on the top. And as a result, it answered our question, actually this sparse um, and high resolution is actually better than this dense um, and low resolution. Okay, so with the same MIOU, the speed is about 30% to 50% faster compared with using um, the dense but low resolution uh, counterpart. And here are some visualizations about the sparsity mask. What did we learn during this process? Actually, um, the sparse VIT learns to prune those redundant background windows. Like in this case, this is a faster version. This is an even faster version, 19 milliseconds, 24 milliseconds. And this is the pruned, the, the, the patches, the windows that is remained, survived the pruning. We can see there are different um, colors, different uh, brightness, because for each layer, we are getting pruned more and more. So those bright area are surviving the pruning for all the layers. This gray area, uh, gray area, they might get pruned in the middle, and this black area, they might get pruned from the very first. So here, uh, the object is left. Uh, the road blocker, the cars are left, survive the pruning. So we're showing that this sparse VIT is pruning those irrelevant background windows and retaining those informative foreground uh, windows object. All right, so that's all for the first two sections about basics of VIT and also efficiency techniques. Uh, we're going to take a break before jumping into self-supervised learning for VIT and also multi-model language model. Okay, let's continue our discussion about vision transformers. Uh, let's now discuss self-supervised learning. How do we apply self-supervised learning for VIT? By expanding the amount of unlabeled data to help us train VIT, starting with the contrastive learning. Um, so the motivation here is that we need a, lot, a large amount of data uh, so that VIT can outperform um, VIT can outperform the CNNs only when we have large amount of data sets. Okay? But labeling those data sets is very costly. And how do we exploit a large amount of unlabeled data to train uh, vision transformers? So we can actually train a large amount of image data that is without, without the label by pre-training the model using uh, this self-supervised learning approach. And then do knowledge transfer similar to the large language model we train a foundation model and then apply it to downstream tasks. Uh, the downstream task is, uh, is smaller, but we can afford to label such a smaller amount of data set. And then apply uh, the, fine, uh, the transferred fine-tuned model on the downstream uh, target task. So this is how do we train uh, the unlabeled data to mitigate this issue? and to train VIT with unlabeled data. So one approach is by using contrastive learning. So you have a cat, and you 
use two different wheels, you rotate it a little bit, paint it with different color, etc. But the cat is still a cat, no matter which wheel you rotate it. On the other side, you feed it with another species, with another class, a dog. And then you want to pass it through the same encoder. And the encoder should encode the result such that uh, the view one, the view two, different views of the cat, they should be um, closer. And the, the cat and dog should be far further away from each other. So the loss, uh, the embeddings will encourage the different views of the same class, the cat, different views of the cat to be closer than cat and dog. So in this way, we didn't naturally uh, do any uh, label, but use the the sample itself just by um, rotating it or sample it with different views, tint it with different colors, crop it, um, those kind of manipulation on the same object to encourage such similarity. And as a result, we can see that if we directly train a pretty large uh, VIT model that is randomly initialized in the first row on a small task like Cypher 10 or Cypher 100, Actually, the VIT is huge, even, uh, it's even worse. This is the accuracy is going down from VIT base to VIT large to VIT, ba uh, to VIT huge. The accuracy is actually going down. Um, but by using the ImageNet self-supervised learning first, and then we apply uh, VIT base large and huge, actually the accuracy is going to get, get up, grow up. Okay, so the self-supervised VIT model deliver a stronger performance um, than the supervised counterparts. It's, this is the supervised counterpart on the second row. And finally, the accuracy can improve on the downstream task as we are using a larger VIT compared with previously using a smaller one. And there is another way, um, popular uh, technique to encourage multi-model contrastive learning. Previously, we are just looking at the image itself. A cat rotated dog, a rocket, rotated cat should still look at look like a cat. Those are purely in the image norm, domain. What about combining the image and also the language domain together? So with each image is associated with a description, like a um, so that we can pass it through both the image encoder for the image and also a text encoder for the description. And this is a description uh, in, in encoding for different tokens. And this is for uh, different images. And we want to encourage the diagonal to be more salient. Okay? Because the diagonal is uh, text 1 is describing image 1, text 2 is describing image 2, um, and so on. So we can use this way to perform large-scale contrastive learning using um, this pair, paired image language, uh, image and text pairs. What we need here is just a pair of image and also this description of the image. So at inference time, for example, we feed it with a, a new image. The class doesn't have to be seen before, which is zero shock, open vocabulary doesn't have to constrain yourself with a thousand classes like ImageNet, but without fine tuning, we can handle any number of classes. We pass the image to image encoder, we pass the, like it's a photo of a something, some object. About different words, we can fill them in and get the uh, similarity. And pick the highest similarity one we find is a photo of a dog. So in this way, we find such zero-shot learning capability is very, um, uh, very helpful, very interesting in this case. If you haven't seen those um, downstream tasks before, no fine-tuning, no retraining can enable such zero-shot learning using Clip. OCA also uh, have very good linear uh, probe uh, results. Linear probe is saying we use a feature from this model, this Clip model, and we train only a one FC layer on the extract the feature to validate the quality of that feature and actually surpass different baseline models.
Another way is actually using masking, uh, mask autoencoder to perform self-supervised learning. There's no label, you're just given uh, the, the target image, uh, similar to uh, masking the language. Here we are masking the input image. Some of them we blacken it out away. Uh, only have a few to uh, tokens. For example, this one, this one, they are masked away. This one is cap, mask, mask, etc. And the task is try to predict the missing patches, predict those missing patches based on the image that is seen. This is very similar to the masked language model where we are masking away part of the words in the sentence. Like the movie is very something as risk. So we are trying to predict um, the token. And in VIT, each image patch is a token, right? So we can use the masking idea to do self-supervised learning for vision tasks as well. And the task is basically to predict the mask token. And in language model, uh, the what is the percentage of the mask? Usually it's a bit low, like 15%. You can mask away 15% of the input tokens uh, at random and predict those masked tokens. So here we, find, we apply it with uh, the token embedding together with the positional uh, encoding all together, feed it to a, a transformer encoder, and finally predict the masked token. Can we apply the similar pre-training strategy in the vision day? So actually here, uh, we mask uh, several patches in the input, these are the uh, uh, survived um, patches that is unmasked. And here in the encoder, different from uh, language, uh, we only process those unmasked tokens. Those are the unmasked tokens we feed it to the encoder. Compared with uh, in NLP task, the masked token is also fed to the uh, transformer. So there are, the good thing is here we have less number of uh, input tokens to improve the compute efficiency. And after the decoder, we get the same number of uh, tokens as output. And according to the position of the mask, like mask, mask, unmask, mask, mask, unmask, according to the position, we are going to recover the full tokens, combining both masks and also an unmask token and pass it through this decoder and trying to recover the original image. And here we use a light decoder to process all the tokens. The number of tokens is getting larger, so here we are using a light decoder. And the reason um, we are using a heavy encoder with only this unmasked token is that Usually, we need to mask a lot of tokens. Okay, so this is the accuracy um, versus the masking masking ratio. What is the trend of the masking versus unmask? You can imagine uh, if we don't mask anything, you are not trying to able to learn. But if you mask too much, everything is masked. It's very hard to predict what is the uh, the patch. Okay, so. There's a sweet spot somewhere in the middle. Um, it's roughly um, 80, 70, 80 percent, between 70 percent and also 80 percent, depending on if it is linear probing or fine tuning. Okay? This ratio is actually much higher compared with BERT's mass ratio, 15 percent, versus the op optimal mass ratio is roughly 70 to 80 percent. So therefore, um, it will be a huge redundancy if we consider not only the unmasked patches, but also the masked patches and feed so, so many masked stuff into the encoder. That's why we only pass through those unmasked tokens, patches into the encoder. And since the decoder has to decode everything, we just feed everything into the decoder and use a lightweighted decoder. 
So this is what it looks like. Um, so this is the mask. This is the recovered image, the bus versus the original bus. Actually, the recovery is really well. A mask lamp. This is recovered lamp. This is ground truth lamp. How amazing it is, given this random, this something looks like a random patch, so I can recover a bird. Waterfall, animals, elevators, everything. So this is pretty amazing. There's no label. Okay? You just mask it and try to recover it. And then you can build a very good feature extractor. Actually, the accuracy is even better than the MoCo, the previous contrastive learning um, idea we have learned. Uh, this is number of blocks fine tuned. The accuracy is pretty significantly better than the baseline. So this is masked autoencoder. Okay, so that's the conclusion for the self-supervised learning techniques for VIT. Uh, just recap, VIT require a lot of data in order to match or sur surpass, uh, outperform CNNs, but getting a lot of labeled data is difficult. That's why we need such self-supervised learning techniques, VIT, to exploit a large amount of unlabeled data including contrastive learning and also masked image encoding, image modeling. So far, we uh, covered both large language model and also vision transformers, applying the same primitive, which is transformers, to both language and also vision. Can we combine them to model um, both vision and language all together? I'm going to introduce two techniques. One is using cross-attention, one is using the visual token. Uh, Flamingo and Palmi are the two represented work. So let's look at what is the state of the art vision uh, language models okay, toward large language models that can see. So this GPT-4V, which is just, just released uh, a few weeks ago, V for vision, can take visual inputs. Like in this example, given the prompt, how much did I pay for tax? Where is the information? The number and also localizing the number in three receipts. One receipt in Costco and two other receipts. Tax is actually pretty small. But GPT-4 way can tell in the first receipt you paid $3.72 for tax. And the information is located on the bottom of the receipt. It's actually right here. It's pretty small but very accurately detected. And in the second receipt, you paid $42.23 for tax. Um, it's somewhere here. In the second, um, the information is located near the bottom of the receipt. And their sales tax line even tell you where it is. In the third receipt, you paid $4.58 for tax. The information is located at the bottom of the receipt under the tax line. In total, you paid even tell you how much you paid in total by summing them up together across all three receipts. So these three receipts are still individual, independent. You don't have to link them together. Oh, you still have to link them together by simply summing them up together. But let's see a more complicated scenario where you have to do reasoning across images. So how much should I pay for the beer on the table according to the price on the menu? The, the vision language model has to first uh, recognize what is the name of the beer and then find the corresponding beer magna from the menu here, $6 for each, and then two of them. So let's see how it performs. According to the menu, the price for magna beer is $6. Since there are two magna beers on the table, two magna beers on the table, total cost for the beers will be $12. Pretty amazing. It can, link the information, the position information, the, the detection information, and also the math, everything together. And to be able to do OCR, to find the text here and match the text between this image and this image, and find the corresponding relationship. And doing the reasoning where uh, the total cost equal to the number of beers times the price per beer, and extract the price per beer from the image here. And such a vision language model can also improve the productivity and relieve, relieve us from very tedious tasks like 
extract the information, read the text in the image, and return the information in the JSON format. What is the class? Date of birth, name, address, everything, expiration date, etc. from the driver's license. We can tell um, the GPT-4, we can tell class, the date of birth, name, everything very accurately, although it can sometimes fail, like the hair color, it says NA, but actually there is a hair color, hair color is, is brown. So uh, there's still limitation, but it's already showing a pretty promising result, extracting our desired information from images um, to uh, improve the productivity. Then let, let's dis, uh, discuss how this is achieved. There are actually roughly two ways uh, for visual uh, language models. One is using cross attention to inject vision into a large language model. Okay, there are two modalities, vision, images, and also languages. We can use a cross attention, QKV, to mingle them together, to mingle the tokens together. That is using the cross attention approach. The other uh, Palmi style is using treating the input image as a visual token, as a token, so that you can concatenate the image token with the text token and treat it, feed everything together into the language model. And let's see them one by one. Flamingo is a representative pioneer work for vision language model using the cross attention based approach. Um, so large language model is frozen. So here, language model is frozen. This is the input. This the image. This is a very cute dog. This image. This is. Let you continue uh, filling the um, sentence. It should be a very serious cat. A very serious cat. And how do we insert the image? Combine that with the language. So previously we have a language model in blue and now we can feed the two input images um, into the vision encoder it can be any it can be a clip for example vision encoder or any pre-trained visual encoder this is frozen no training similarly the language model block is frozen is no no fine tuning and here we have a new block which is called perceiver resampler what it does is basically the image may come in different resolutions. We want to uh, make sure we feed the same resolution to the cross-attention cross uh, layer. We're going to talk about this uh, in the next slide. So for now, we just turn uh, this different input resolution image into the same number of tokens, no matter how big, how small it is. Here we get the same amount of image tokens. And now we feed the image token through this gated cross-attention. Um, layer. And then what is the cross attention? We are going to introduce that later. So we are going to tune a uh, tune from scratch this perceiver and this ga gated cross attention followed by FFN layer. Okay. And let's see how they work, how the cross attention work, and then how uh, the gated cross attention work. So let's first talk about the perceiver resampler. So the input size may differ. Okay, and if it is a not video, a vision, um, not image, but also video, the number of frames may also differ. So we want to make sure uh, after the perceiver, we get the same amount of uh, number of tokens. In this case, how many patches do we have? We have um, not three by three. We have nine patches, nine tokens for each input image, and this video frame has three frames. So all together we have um, flattened 27, 27 tokens uh, from the video's uh, input. Okay, so we treat the video as three frames. Each frame is nine tokens. All together we have 27 tokens. We also want to learn a latent query. Um, uh, learn latent query. In this case, as an example, the number of tokens is five in this case. So those are the learned end-to-end. -end. You can backpropagate, get a gradient to update this learned query. And here, the K and V is the concatenated version okay, of the visual token and the learned query. So here we are concatenating these 27 
um, image token with these five tokens of learn the query. So we get a, um, the K and V, they are of size 32, 27 plus five. Okay? Concatenating them, 27 plus five. Well, the query is the learn the token. The query is the learn the token, five tokens. Implementation wise, uh, we initialize the learned um, R learned tokens, RD is the, is the shape. Okay? And here, um, the feature is the combination of um, the flattened version of number of timestamps versus number of tokens per timestamp. So 9 times 7, uh, 9 times 3 is 27. And then the KV is concatenating this learned feature with um, the flattened version of the image token. And the Q is basically, uh, the Q is basically the learned uh, latent token. Okay, and we have the QKV uh, in this case. So what is the dimension of the output? How many tokens do we have in the output? We know the Q has five learned tokens. The KV has 32 tokens. The final number of tokens equal to the number of tokens in Q. That is QK transpose times V. So the dimension is following the dimension of Q, which is five. In this case, no matter how many input visual tokens you have, the output, the output num number of output tokens is always five, which is the learned latent query. And you can set that number so that you can always get the same amount of output token through perceiver, no matter what is the resolution and no matter what is the number of frames in the video. So the output is always five tokens um, by dimension. So this is the uh, perceiver resampler from varying size, large feature map into a, a few fixed size visual tokens. And by uh, this cross attention, we inject the vision information into the language and everything becomes blended into token. And let's see how is that blending done. Okay, so this is the five by hidden dimension in our previous example. And we feed this gated cross attention followed by dense layer. Okay, so this is the, something new. Okay, previously we had seen this attention FFM, attention FFM, but now between them we have a 10H gating to control how much information from the image side we are going to inject to the language. So here uh, we have the time h alpha uh, times this attention. This is the original cross attention, the q and the kv. And this time h, this alpha is initialized with a zero. So not using um, the image information at all. Um, so we are going to learn that gating parameter for the cross attention and also for the FFM, which was initialized from zero. So initially we are not taking into account the image information, but as we learn, we are going to gradually uh, take the input image information into the uh, IFFN, uh, into the uh, attention mechanism. Okay, so let's see how does Flamingo perform. Um, this is in context learning capability. So the input prompt, we can give it three examples to describe the task. Like this is a chinchilla, there are many found in Chile. This is a Shiba, they are uh, very popular in Japan. And then ask, this is, and let you fill in the rest. It's going to say, this is a flamingo, uh, they are found in the Caribbean and South Africa, America. Similarly, uh, what is the title of this painting? What is the painting displayed? Where is the name of the city? And you can tell the location, the city. Similar here, we can do OCR. This is basically telling the language model to do OCR to recognize the text from the image. And you can tell from uh, two examples, you can tell the third one without any description of the task. Uh, two plus one is three, five plus six is 11, basically um, doing OCR and also doing math. You can tell is 18. Oh, there's a adversarial example here. Um, 
iPod. It's actually performing quite well. This is Apple with a sticker on it. Uh, what does the sticker say? Actually, we are doing the um, visual dialogue. Uh, what does the sticker say? The sticker says iPod. Um, where is the photo taken? It looks like it's taken in the backyard. And do you think it's printed or handwritten? It looks like it's handwritten. And what is the what color is the sticker? It says it's white. So it's actually doing a quite good job. And similarly, we can do others like this is a picture of two teddy bears on the moon. I can prompt it. What is what are they doing? They're having a conversation. What object are they using? Looks like a computer. Uh, is it surprising? Yes, it's surprising. Uh, why is it surprising? I think it's surprising because teddy bears are not usually found on the moon. It's a lot of common sense, actually. Uh, here, this is a cityscape. It looks like Chicago. What do you make think this is Chicago? Uh, because the shed acronym on the background. I can give you another, give it another image. What about this one? Which uh, city is this? A well, famous landmark, help you recognize it. It's Tokyo. I think it's because of the Tokyo Tower. You can do this multi round uh, conversation pretty well. So there's another style of vision language model. Okay? By treating these input, uh, input images as tokens, as image tokens. Okay? So taking visual inputs as tokens so that we can support a lot more flexible modalities, not just vision, not just in vision and also language, but also others like control, okay? like the robot states. Um, like neural 3D representation, a lot more other modalities for treating everything as tokens. Okay? So language token, uh, this robot state token, image token, language token, okay? how to grasp the blue block, okay? and then the output is first grab yellow block, and then blah, blah. I can convert it into the control signal. Okay? So uh, this can be very helpful for robotics applications since both the vision and also the uh, robot states can be embedded into tokens. And we just feed everything into the large language model, large language model. So it can handle a lot of manipulation tasks. And so also handle this visual question and answering. Like given this image here, image is embedded as a token, image token. Question is, what is the image? Answer them in emojis. And then it's going to tell a lot of fruits in emojis. Describe the following image, and then can say a dog jumping over a hurdle um, at a dog show. Okay, so this is can also handle these language only tasks, uh, tabletop manipulation, and task uh, motion planning, and also this is the uh, final result using the robot to manipulate the banana. You can directly output control signals as tokens. Instruction is displayed here. Put strawberry into the correct bin. So here we are using the metro language language model to uh, add extra like, common sense. It knows that strawberry should go to the same bucket of strawberry bucket. So if we only have vision data, we don't know that's a German flag, but the language model really helped. Okay, there are more fun examples to see. And this is like the vision language model trained by our TA. 
uh, I'm going to show this. It's pretty exciting to handle those corner cases in self-driving. Given this image, uh, the train the model, um, is what is uh, unusual about this image? The model says the, the chair is flying, um, seeming coming out of the back of the truck. And what should you do if we encounter this? Uh, it's going to say you should immediately stop your vehicle and move to the same distance. If you don't have the training images um, in the training data set, the vision language model uh, can help you handle some of the corner cases like this. I don't know if in that specific paper, but for LiDAR, definitely it's possible to encode uh, that into tokens. And actually, we described that in the uh, one of the present, uh, slide about how to handle the spar sparsity in the um, in the uh, in the LiDAR sensor in the point cloud. So you can definitely encode LiDAR information into tokens. In this this work, everything, every modality is encoded into tokens. All right, so here's the summary of today's lecture. We started with the basics of vision transformers. So using transformers to not only handle language, but also vision tasks. So each, piece, each patch is a token, or each window, we can do, also do window attention. Okay? So that brings the problem, the ON square complexity with the resolution cannot handle large resolution very well. How do we do it? Then we can use window attention so that you do only attention within a window. But what about information flow? You shift it across adjacent uh, layers so that you can encourage the information to flow. That's window attention. And then efficient VIT is using the linear attention rather than ON square. It's proportional to N and replace uh, the softmax attention with linear attention. And also sparse attention. Those sparse high resolution is better than dense and low resolution. And also using sparsity, we can prove in the batch dimension, which is pretty hardware friendly. Uh, so supervised learning for VIT, since VIT require large amount of data to surpass CN architectures, a large amount of data is difficult to label. Then we can use contrastive learning for the mask image modeling, which is pretty interesting, like masking like 80%, 70% of the image tokens to, uh, to try to predict it. And then we introduce multi-model language model, including using cross attention to inject the vision information or use uh, individual tokens, treat different modalities all as tokens. In the next lecture, our I'll be traveling to uh, Toronto for a micro conference. Our TAG will introduce other exciting uh, um, applications like how to accelerate GAN, video recognition, and also point cloud. Hope you uh, will enjoy this lecture next Tuesday. And by the way, our project ideas are released. So um, the project are ideas are released on Canvas. It's open-ended project. We just give you some pointer to help you get started. Um, those are very well curated projects with starter code and also some, uh, some demos um, released on Canvas. You feel free to propose your own projects uh, you can either based on our proposal or you can propose your own. It will be done in groups of two to three uh, students. Uh, it's open-ended. If you need any help, feel free to come to me or come to our office hour. That's all for today. Thank you and see you next week.